Hello and welcome. Uh, we hope that you're well and thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar on uh, chalice mining. My name is Jacob Willoughby and I'm uh, Vice President of Research and Analyst at Red Cloud Securities Incorporated. Joining me remotely today is Alex Dorsch, Managing Director of Chalice Mining. As always, we'll begin today's webinar with a presentation on the company by Alex, followed by our question and answer period. As a reminder, you can type in your questions at any time. And we'll try and get through as many as we can at the end. But before we begin, I'd like to note that there may be some forward-looking statements made in this webinar, and I would direct listeners to the cautionary notes on page two of Chalice Mining's corporate presentation located on their website. For Red Cloud Securities Incorporated, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we note that this webinar does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Company-specific disclosures for Red Cloud are the following. In the last 12 months preceding the date of issuance of the research report or recommendation, Red Cloud Securities Incorporated has performed investment banking services and been retained under a service or advisory agreement by the issuer. Also in the last 12 months, a partner director or officer of Red Cloud Securities Incorporated or the analyst involved in the preparation of the research report has received compensation for investment banking services from the issuer. And now I'm very happy to introduce you to Alex Dorsch, Managing Director of Chalice Mining. Thanks very much, Jacob, and thanks all, all of you uh, over in North America for, uh, for joining me uh, today to talk about uh, Chalice. Um, so obviously, um, we're becoming quite well known as a company now, uh, and really that's off the back of our world-class Julemar discovery uh, here in Western Australia. Um, so I'll take you through the, the latest uh, news on that front, as well as uh, give you a quick introduction to the company for those who don't know Chalice. So as uh, Jacob said, uh, our usual forward-looking statements of disclosures are here. Um, they're available uh, on our website if you want to read these in full, and I encourage you to do that. Um, so Chalice is a unique exploration company. Um, we have a globally significant discovery, as I said. It's a re relatively recent uh, PGE nickel, copper, cobalt, and gold discovery in, in WA. It was made in uh, March of last year. It's uh, what we consider Australia's first major palladium discovery. Australia doesn't really have a primary producing PGE mine, and there's really not too many uh, PGE discoveries really outside of the, the South Africa and Russian uh, jurisdictions. So this is quite a unique uh, new discovery. It's emerging as a very large strategic deposit of critical clean energy metals, so not only the PGEs, but also nickel, copper, cobalt. Uh, and that means it's highly leveraged to not only the battery thematic in the nickel cobalt space, but also hydrogen, um, particularly in hydrogen production, purification, and obviously fuel cells. Um, we've also got an unrivaled pipeline of other discovery opportunities in Australia. We've really found a new province here uh, where our jewel of my discovery lies in, in Western, uh, Western Australia. We've got large exploration holdings in Victoria and in the Kimberley. We've got nine uh, drill rigs working for the company at the moment across two projects, six of those on the on the discovery at Julemar. Uh, so we've got, a, a, as it says there, a well-funded and high-performance team. Uh, we've, we've shown time and time again, I guess, that uh, we have well, this proven ability to make the discoveries and, and turn them into, uh, into feasible mining operations. Uh, we've got almost 150 million Australian dollars in cash and investments, about 130 of, of that is cash, uh, and we're up over 2,000% uh, since the beginning of 2020, so it's been a spectacular uh, last uh, 12 months or so for, for shareholders. So where our project is, you can see the number one on the page there on the left, our Julemar discovery is just outside of Perth. Um, the first uh, drill hole we drilled on that property intersected 19 metres of 8.4 grams palladium, 2.6% nickel and 1% copper. Uh, it's quite a quite an unbelievable drill hole. Uh, we've now drilled about 205 additional drill holes in that time. Uh, we've got 100% control of it. It's a major uh, unrecognised intrusive complex, and uh, we're targeting a, a maiden mineral resource in the middle of th this year. 
our other two projects there listed. So Pyramid Hill in the in the what uh, Canadians are quite familiar with, uh, one of the highest grade and most prolific gold uh, districts in Australia. The Victorian goldfields. We've got uh, five thousand square kilometres of holding there around the Fosterville gold mine. Two diamond rigs drilling for us, and one air core rig drilling for us at the moment. Uh, again, 100% control of that property. Uh, and then we've got a property uh, in the northwest of Australia called Hawkstone. Uh, it's a large uh, greenfield play. Uh, we recently completed some uh, some drilling on that property. It's an earlier stage property, but one we think holds a particular promise, particularly for nickel, copper and cobalt. Uh, so I mentioned that we're up 2,000% in terms of TSR since the beginning of January. You can see the catalysts uh, along the uh, the journey there in the last 12 months. In the last uh, month or so, um, actually just today, we uh, we announced our 11th high-grade zone in the discovery at Julamar. We recently completed a $15 million uh, share purchase plan to retail holders. Uh, and we've also secured access to major regional targets immediately north of the Discovery and the State Forest. So that's really been the, uh, the the last couple of months, and you can see there it really was sort of one catalyst after another in a, in a pretty eventful 12 months for the company. Uh, in terms of the financials and the shareholding, that uh, we've got our uh, insider, our chairman, hold, holding 11% of the shareholders' shares uh, on issue. Uh, institutional register that 31 percent now is 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 growing rapidly um, we've got about 342 million shares on issue um, uh, at a share price today four dollar sixty or so that equates to about 1.6 billion uh, market cap uh, I mentioned the cash and investments of almost 150 million Australian dollars we do have a couple of investments over in Canada o3 uh, mining we hold five percent of that company and also Caspin Resources, one of the one of the closest uh, projects to our Julamar discovery. We own ten percent of that company, so uh, so definitely, uh, obviously, growing uh, institutional dominator register and, uh, and a sound financial position. So uh, I mentioned that we'd made a first hole discovery. Um, it's seventy kilometres northeast of Perth. That comes with. Uh, obviously, for those who are unfamiliar with Perth, Perth's a, a city of sort of circa 2 million people. So you get, uh, you know, world-class infrastructure really just right on the doorstep uh, here where, you know, we're sort of tens of kilometres away from major highway, rail, power, uh, and a port is about 90 kilometres by sort of dual lane highway or rail. So there's fantastic infrastructure uh, around this project. Um, the magnetic image you can see there on the left highlights this 26 kilometre long magnetic signature that we now know is a, is a layered mafic, ultramafic intrusive complex. Uh, we call it the Julemar complex and it's really basically our discovery. Uh, it really hadn't been looked at uh, in any, with any sort of nickel copper PGA exploration previously. So, uh, so we identified that in 2018. We've uh, been limited really to the southern end of the complex on private land, but we have now just started the initial reconnaissance on the, on the northern sort of 24 Odd kilometres now that we've got an access approval to that area, uh, and uh, we've got 8,000 square kilometres of additional holdings around the discovery. So we've really leveraged to the next uh, phase of uh, discovery here as well. So our discovery, we call it uh, the Gonville intrusion. This is the part of the complex off the southern end at southern two kilometres. We've got about a 1.6 kilometre long by 800 metre wide uh, intrusion here. It's a sill. Uh, geometry, so it's uh, dipping moderately to the west, over to the left-hand side of that page, and plunging moderately to the uh, to the north. And so that sill geometry basically is reflected in that magnetic high that you see there on that image. Uh, so within that intrusion, we've got eleven uh, high-grade zones. They're a mixture of PGEs, nickel, copper, cobalt, uh, as well as uh, you know, uh, in some cases more nickel cobalt dominant, in some cases more copper PGE dominant. Um, and all of them remain open. So you can see there on the, on the image there, you can see the, uh, the open arrows there basically on every single uh, wireframe. We've got uh, on top of that 125 isolated high-grade intersections that are yet to be you know, included in those 11 zones. Um, so they either represent new zones or, or ones that just really we haven't yet done enough infill drilling around to understand what they, uh, what they could be. 
and and then basically everything within and surrounding those high grade uh, zones is basically uh, disseminated sulfide mineralization so we've got half gram to two gram pges and gold uh, basically everywhere throughout that intrusion down to about 800 meters below surface so you get a, a sense of the scale of this body it is an extraordinarily large uh, intrusive package of geology that's extraordinarily well endowed in sulfide mineralization uh, it's a very very un unusual uh, new discovery particularly to make in 2020 uh, and then obviously the um, sitting above that fresh rock we've got about a 25 meter thick oxide profile that's also enriched in palladium so we're looking at anywhere from 0.8 even as high as three and a half grams palladium from surface down to a depth of 25 meters so that is essentially the weathered basement there that's uh, that's been uh, that's been through the super gene effect uh, enriched in uh, in palladium so it's a bit like uh, you've got three ore bodies in one um, and it's a pretty spectacular new discovery we've we've drilled about 200 holes about 55,000 meters we think we need to drill about 160,000 meters in total um, to to uh, to really define this resource properly uh, we've also started some, uh, you know, a, a second phase of MET test work, and that's ongoing. Where we will update, um, we will get some results shortly on that. But basically, we've seen that the sulphide mineralization that we've encountered is uh, is amenable to flotation. So we're expecting fairly conventional flow sheet um, type of processing. We haven't seen a great deal of uh, deleterious elements like arsenic or talc, and also the oxide mineralization. So that first 25 meters, we think we can recover. The palladium and the gold from so a uh, a very a very complex ore body but one that's uh, you know got phenomenal uh, high grade within it and obviously a very very large footprint uh, so that's why we've got three uh, three RC and three diamond rigs out there at the moment we're also expecting additional diamond rigs to uh, to uh, to join shortly this is uh, looking at the intrusion from another angle so looking down to the northwest here over those eleven high grade zones. There's a couple of things just to point out there on every one of these drill holes. You see a, a, a pink as well as a red uh, hash next to the next to that um, drill hole. The red is basically denominating what we consider high grades, so greater than a gram palladium, uh, and then the the pink is basically the disseminated sulfide mineralization, which we've delineated as as greater than 0.3 grams per ton palladium. So. The other thing you'll note here is, uh, as you can see, these zones are pretty much uh, consistently dipping to the west. So you're looking sort of down the dip here, and the outline of the intrusion is in the grey there as well. And the intrusion itself is is open, as is earmarked by those grey arrows. So um, we've got significant strike lengths to some of these zones. These two orange zones, G4 and G11, at the bottom of this page, they strike over you know circa a kilometre. Uh, and they dip over sort of circa 300 to, to 400 meters, and then there's these internal zones in the red, which are which are away from the contact or the margin of the intrusion, and they strike over um, several hundred meters. Uh, and and you can see there again all the open arrows basically in every direction. You can see some of the recent high grade intercepts in, in those zones as well that we've announced. But what you see from the, the each of those holes is really that there is mineralization essentially everywhere. So there is a really saturated sulfide um, uh, intrusive package, um, and you can see there, you know, the, the the drill spacing is now getting quite well defined down the southern end of the of the ore body, uh, and up the up the northern end here, it's uh, it's still quite loosely spaced and quite uh, broad spaced. Looking at the, that in section, um, we've got these internal zones, so the red zones here. We're looking at a section sort of midway. Um, you know, along the strike length of those zones. We've got palladium, nickel, copper, cobalt ridge zones from about three to 40 metres wide. Um, they're very shallow, they're open, as I said, and we've got about 152 high-grade intersections now to date in those zones, and you can see some of them are, are, are quite spectacular. So, uh, you know, a recent intersection there, 39 metres of 3.8 grams palladium, uh, 0.6 platinum, 0.3 nickel, 0.2 copper, um, some of the other intercepts there, you know, you can see even higher palladium grades, in some cases high grade gold, nickel and copper as well. Uh, so, and you can see the, the zones uh, and the intrusion itself just basically continue dipping to the west there off the left of that page.
uh, looking at another section, so over now on the eastern half of the of the intrusion, we've got these G4 and G11 zones. And the reason why we colour them differently, the reason why we think about them differently is that they're more platinum, palladium, uh, copper dominant zones. So they're, they're not so much nickel, uh, cobalt zones, they're, they're the other metals. And again, they're you know anywhere from three to 50 metres wide. Again, very shallow, uh, open, a long strike and down dip. And uh, we've got about 82 intersections now into those two zones um, that you can see there again from looking at that page, some pretty phenomenal examples of you know, 50 metres of 1.8 grams palladium, 0.9 gram gold, 1.1% copper from 112 metres, you know, 11 metres of 13 grams palladium, 1.3 grams platinum, 0.3 grams gold, you know, from 78 metres. So there's some very high grade examples there of both palladium and platinum, uh, as well as, you know, decent amount of gold and uh, copper in these zones as well. And as you can see, if you look at the, the, the basically that grey unit is the country rocks on the on the margin of the intrusion. So everything left of that uh, or up above that grey is uh, is intrusive geology. Then we've got these lighter green, so um, uh, post-mineralised uh, dolerite dikes, which are cutting through the package. They affect the continuity a little bit of mineralization, but you can see there that they are reasonably narrow, and uh, and obviously they're quite variable along this eastern side of the uh, the intrusion here. Probably the most uh, significant thing about that is that everything I've just been showing you is uh, is really just this dot at the base of this page here. So there's two maps on this page. On the left hand side is a magnetic image, and on a right hand on the right hand side is an airborne EM image. Um, and what, what we're basically looking at here is basically our granted tenements. As you can see, the, the granted tenements start on private land here where the discovery is, and then they extend north into this Julemar State Forest. Uh, if you look at the Airborne EM response, this was um, basically flown by us in, in September 2020. We've got a uh, significant you know, EM response from the discovery itself, as you'd expect, given this is uh, sulphide mineralization. And then we've got something like six and a half kilometres of additional airborne EM response here extending into the state forest. So that Hartog uh, EM anomaly there is, is it doesn't have a drill hole in it as yet. And we've only just commenced uh, uh, really the, the first on ground exploration activities over that target. So this airborne EM is really just a guide um, to say, you know, what, what areas might be worth, you know, initial reconnaissance. We will be doing basically, you know, regional spaced and prospect scale um, spaced uh, geochemistry and uh, and ground EM through that entire red corridor. So I guess yeah, don't uh, don't just because the airborne EM is is dead, don't uh, don't don't uh, just assume that there's no mineralisation there. So uh, that's why I guess the um, we're considering this as as a, as a globally significant new discovery. Really, just. Uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, strike length of the potential mineral system here is is uh, is quite unbelievable. So the PGEs, uh, I'm sure um, everyone's aware that you know that majority of them at the moment are going to your exhaust system in your car. At the moment, there is a real shortage of palladium, uh, which is uh, really driven by the increased uh, emission standards, particularly in China, uh, but also in Europe. Um, so palladium is really the preferred catalyst in these uh, in these catalytic converters, and given the lack of uh, recent discoveries and and the and the, the control of supply essentially by two jurisdictions, that's driven the price of palladium extremely high. So uh, sitting at about twenty four hundred US dollars an ounce at the moment. Uh, what's what's interesting for the PGEs as well as what we're hearing about more and more now is uh, is hydrogen economy. And particularly when in the production purification of hydrogen, as well as in hydrogen fuel cells themselves, you'll 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 start to hear a lot more about platinum and palladium, uh, and and that uh, that is definitely in an emerging space. Even sort of uh, you know big bulk carriers and, and and large mining companies here in Australia talking about uh, converting their fleets of ships and and trucks to to hydrogen. So it's uh, it's definitely a, a good uh, backdrop for uh, for PGE demand. This uh, just shows you the, that history of the palladium price. You can see it sort of went vertical there in uh, in the late sort of um, 2018, 19 period, and that's really, as it says there, basically substitution of uh, of platinum out for for palladium, and that really was driven by Euro six as well as China five and China six emission standards there. 
the uh, so the project, um, I guess you know, it's got the potential to deliver not only a, a huge economic benefit but also jobs, skills um, to the wheat belt region. We've got a fairly unique opportunity here in that we don't need to build a, a camp or a FIFO a workforce. We've got a you know a really a workforce of, of local permanent residents that live you know in proximity to the to the mine site that uh, is having a huge impact on on the way the community is viewing this. We're uh, being very active and open with the, the local community, and really what what gives us uh, confidence, I guess, that this is going to be mined and, and can be mined successfully is the is the the amount of successful you know mining projects in and around state forest areas in WA. So there's at least four there listed. Boddington is a is a good example of a large scale gold deposit uh, in state forest and and in a mix of state forest and private land, and that's uh, been operating for some time. Uh, and we we are taking our responsibilities seriously. I guess you know that we're taking a proactive approach to how we uh, how we undertake uh, activities, and uh, we're very cognizant about uh, obviously keeping our our uh, our impact a, a very light touch. In the in the Jolama State Forest area, where we're just uh, kicking off activities now. So this is the timeline, uh, really, for the next sort of six months or so. Um, you can see there we've got access uh, approved to the for the Jolama State Forest. The uh, reconnaissance work is just starting in there. Then we will be going back for a second stage approval to go uh, to go to drilling activities, and then we anticipate drilling really in the middle of the in the middle of this year. Uh, in the meantime, obviously, we've got six rigs drilling on private land, and, and I should mention that uh, the private land that that uh, hosts the, the Gonville Discovery is largely ours. Now we own about eighty-five percent of the land um, that uh, that sits on top of the Discovery, uh, and uh, I guess the the next step is not only uh, our second phase of of metallurgical test work results, but also real resource modelling and and pit shell modelling to get ourselves to an indicated resource category. Uh, constrained to an open pit. That's where we want to be by the by the middle of the year. So that's the outlook for this year. I won't go through each one of these, but suffice to say, we're moving ahead our our major discovery as quickly as possible. We're also, you know, doing the soft things uh, correctly. We're really continuing to build the trust and uh, and also expand our sustainability presence to make sure that I guess people appreciate that this is a very rare deposit of critical critical metals. So, um, so I guess you, you've heard me say that it's a world-class discovery. It really has opened up a new mineral province. That entire western half of WA is all of a sudden probably the, the most exciting exploration destination on the on the planet right now. We've got three rigs. Don't forget, we've got three rigs drilling at the Pyramid Hill Gold Project in Victoria as well, in proximity to Fosterville. Uh, and we've done some drilling as well up in the Kimberley as well. So we're really hungry for greenfield discoveries. We've got a fantastic track record, and I guess uh, that's what we're, we're aiming to continue to do is just add value with the drill bit and uh, and obviously push Julemar into feasibility stages as quickly as we can. So, uh, Jacob, I'll, uh, I'll pause there and uh, take some questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Um, so... Um, Start off with a question from a participant here, um, just remarking that, uh, of course, most of your stock activity is on the, the ASX and there's uh, not, not a lot of trading on the OTC. And they're wondering, what are your thoughts on attracting U.S. investors um, uh, into the story? Yeah, look, we we are looking into uh, you know an upgrade in the platform, you know, from the from the QB market to the QX uh, market, and I, I suspect that will that will happen in the in the near term. Um, look, we 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 currently don't have you know clearing um, a facilitation in in the US, and that's obviously a, a major thing that we need to um, we need to um, you know kick off. So uh, so expect to see. I guess, I guess uh, at the moment it's a little bit difficult. I guess the um, with with borders shut and the inability to go marketing through the US in person, a little bit more uh, unusual circumstances than 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 norm. Uh, so, but yeah, look, we we can we cognizant of existing US holders and and uh, and in, in Canada as well. So, you know, we're looking to support those markets as much as we can. Uh, second part of the question uh, was pointing out that the stock is at a 52-week high, and and the participants wondering how much more upside is possible in 2021. 
Yeah, look, I think we, we are off just off our 52-week high. I think we were around uh, the $4.90 mark, uh, you know, late last week. So we, we're currently trading around $4.60. Look, I think, uh, you know, really the, the world is our oyster here. You know, I guess we're still in the early stage of exploration. Um, you know, I, I showed you the map there, you know, where we've, where we've really put drill holes over about two kilometres of strike length. And we think the system is about circa 26 kilometres long. So I would, I would say, you know, obviously exploration here is a longer, long journey and it's a longer term play. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, you know, really the, the upside is, 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 is inherent in the, in the geology there. Um, so I, I think that's really what our focus is, is, you know, get the geology right. What's in the ground is fixed, you know, and really we need to get a, a, our knowledge of the geology absolutely perfect. Before we uh, before we get too ahead of ourselves, so that's really what we're focused on doing, and that's where we think the you know the major catalyst uh, will come from. Um, before I forget, I just um, a note to participants: uh, Alex mentioned a term which, if you are familiar with Australian mining, uh, then you know very well. But maybe if you're not uh, North American. Uh, which was FIFO, which is uh, Australian mining speak for fly in, fly out. So uh, I think Alex was just mentioning that, uh, of course, being 70 kilometers from Perth and around communities, uh, they wouldn't need to uh, construct a camp uh, for mining activities in the future. Yeah, look, and it's a huge advantage. It's a good point. Um, I should have clarified that, that, you know, we, we don't need to build an airport, a camp, a lot of that we don't have a lot of those logistical constraints that come with a lot of you know large you know projects in remote Australia. So really, we're right on Perth's doorstep here, which is a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from a participant asking about um, the royalty portfolio that you have amassed over the years, and have you ever considered perhaps spinning that out into uh, some other vehicle? We we haven't uh, given that too much thought, but I guess uh, you know Julemar is still a you know fairly new development in our portfolio. So look, we we will always uh, you know be open for you know for you know ideas that, that maximise shareholder value. Uh, at the moment, you know the portfolio royalties are fairly early stage, so you know there's a lot of option value in them as opposed to intrinsic value. So uh, I think you know obviously if the time's right, where one of those royalties looked like it uh, it is starts to carry a decent amount of value then you know we will look at any any and all options to uh, to maximize the value of it right and and while we're talking about royalties um maybe we'll just uh reiterate that uh, you own the ground where julemar is right now um but uh were there any royalties in in purchasing that ground from uh the folks that you bought it from no, no, none at all. So we've kept it 100% um, control, really, of everything we hold at Julema, uh, as well as in Victoria, as well as just worth noting that we, we own 100% of that 5,000 square kilometres as well. So so in terms of, yeah, um, existing encumbrances or anything like that, it's, uh, it's nil. Right, excellent. Uh, another question here from a participant asking about uh, your gold exploration uh, and, and when you might have some uh, results on, on that part of the uh, story. Yeah, look, we will have some results out shortly for Victoria. We do have a, a, a small amount of the drill results, the drill holes now. Uh, we, we've got about a 10 hole program and we'll re release the first batch of results in the, in the coming few days, a week. Um, so the, yeah, so that's obviously, um, that's obviously in the back of our minds, it probably doesn't, doesn't uh, have the the profile of that project that it once was purely because I guess Gulamar is such a such a, a you know a, a remarkable discovery, um, but uh, but obviously we, we haven't forgotten about the project and we we keep, we keep uh, pushing uh, pushing the gold project forward there in Victoria. Right. Okay. Uh, another question asking about at this point, do you envision there being multiple pits or one very large one? Uh, the participant notes that uh, the zones seem fairly dispersed. Uh, this is a good question. Yeah, look, it's a very good question. I think, uh, look, as as we drill more holes, I think we're probably leaning to the latter in that, you know, this looks to be a very, you know, large um, you know, uh, um, type of, you know, deposit and, and type of geometry that's probably amenable to a, to a larger scale, larger throughput type of operation. Uh, I mean, you, there are there are sort of you know 
150, 200 meters between our our red, you know, G1 to G1, G2 zones and those G4, G11, the orange zones. So there is a there is a bit of a, a gap, if you like, but if you have a look in that gap, you know, you see basically consistent disseminated sulfide mineralization that, you know, in it's it's we we don't obviously have the information yet and we don't have the studies to show that that is uh, that is economic, but we we anticipate that it it, it certainly could be. So uh, so that leads us to believe, I guess, that you know, whilst the the pits may start as discrete, uh, you know, separate smaller pits, they ultimately may merge when you when you go after the uh, the lower grade uh, part of the deposit. So I think that's where we're, that's where we're thinking it's going at the moment. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do, and we, we're just starting to iterate on resource, you know, pit shells that sort of thing at the moment. Obviously, our data, you know, our database, you know, gets refreshed, you know, every every month or so. It really does change quite dramatically. So, so we can we can just use that as a guide. Um, but certainly by the middle of the year, I think it'll become clear, you know, just sort of what pit dimensions we we, we have to work with. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, another interesting question. Um, in the past, Chalice has always been uh, an excellent explorer that usually divests of uh, projects um, and, and returns capital to shareholders. That's kind of been the, uh, the playbook for Chalice. So uh, there's a participant asking, are, are you guys actually considering that this would be something you want to change the strategy of the company and, and put into production yourselves? Or is it just too far away at this point to even think about that? Yeah, I think I think we would change um, the the strategy or change ownership of the asset should we become like not the natural owner. I think that that's probably the, my best way of, of describing that is if the become if the if the asset becomes too large or the project hurdle you know construction hurdle becomes too large, that may be a scenario where we say we're no longer the natural owner. You know, if we if we need to dilute our holders, you know, excessively and take on excessive risk. In developing a project like this, you know, I think that probably says to us we're not the natural owner of the, the project anymore. But while, while in this sort of stage, I think we we are the we are the ultimate uh, natural owner. Really, we have 100% control. We have a very you know low um, corporate overhead. We're very lean. We're very quick. We're very dynamic. We, we're quick to make decisions. So I think we're we're the perfect owner of the asset for the time being. Um, you know how far we how far we get down the track. Uh, you know in the asset, I think depends on a lot of variables. Um, so it, it is hard to it is hard to predict the future. But yeah, look, that I think that that view is correct in saying our strategy has been very very successful in the past, and I think we have been rewarded um, by that by you know sticking to that strategy. So I guess you know we we know we know uh, you know where, what our, where our roots are, and and you know we know our position very well in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, question that, that I have that I'm, I'm dying to hear more about is the, the met metallurgical study work. Um, how is it going and, and, and when do you think you'll be uh, able to announce further results from that? Yeah, it's going, it's going very well. So you, you recall, Jacob, we started sort of the flotation, the detailed flotation test work on the G1, G2, 3 and 4, some composites from, from that material. We will have some results very shortly on G1, G2. Um, we, we wanted to really get locked cycle flotation tests done, so that's taken a little bit longer. So we, we haven't just sort of left it open-ended and always, you know, new, using new, you know, reagents. We wanted to, like, recirculate those reagents and get a real steady state type of uh, profile in terms of recovery, you know, um, versus grade. So we, we want to um, we want to really get that, that thorough work done prove that that uh, you know that differential flotation and, and you know prove I guess that you know what products we can we think we can make uh, and we're really not far away from from being able to demonstrate that to the market so so uh, expect to hear some news on on that as well as some outcomes in terms of metal recoveries and and that sort of thing and 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 uh, recovery grade profile um, obviously that that's we we know I guess the you know the importance of those those uh, those numbers and those outcomes I wouldn't say I wouldn't say this this phase of work is going to be the definitive outcome, but it's certainly going to paint a picture. I think you know a bit narrow the, the confidence level you know, as we get you know f further towards feasibility studies. 
One thing we're not going to have, unfortunately, is the G4 or, or any of these uh, like G11 or anything like that. We're gonna not, just not going to have test work, you know, that's representative of all the styles of mineralization, but certainly we'll have enough, I think, to, to paint a, you know, a good 80-20 type of answer. Uh, and I should mention as well that, you know, obviously we're still working on a cyanide leach um, for the oxide profile as well. So it looks like that's the sort of flow sheet we're, we're conceptually thinking of is a, is a base metals, conventional base metals fermentation circuit, as well as a, as well as a potentially, you know, um, in, in series cyanide circuit to, uh, to recover not only the oxide, but any sort of remnant PGEs from the, from the tail of the, of the base metal circuit. So there, it will be quite a novel, it will be probably quite a novel flow sheet. I think, you know, that we haven't really seen a lot of oxide material like this uh, anywhere else in the world. We, we really sort of, you know, that's why we're taking a little bit longer. We're just, you know, getting the right science, the right expertise in, in, the, in the test work to, to make sure we get it absolutely right. Uh, and it will be an evolving, it will be an evolving story. I guess, you know, everyone knows that, you know, the, the, the final recovery number you use is not always the first one that the company um, publishes. So, so we we just have to learn, just like we've done with the geology. We'll learn uh, we'll learn as we go with the metallurgy as well. Great. I, I was going to ask you about the the oxide stuff as well. So thanks for for touching on that. I'll go back to a participant question here. Um, someone is asking, you know, how how exactly do you de define zones? Can you maybe walk us through the process? Is there uh, specific geology components to these, or or how is how do you separate those out? So, so sometimes there's a visual um, break in sulfide abundance. In some of the holes, it's quite obvious where the high grade material is, and then in others, it's not very obvious at all. So it's quite a continuum from low low sulfide abundance, sort of you know trace to three percent sulfides, all the way up to massive you know semi massive massive sulfides. So, you know, 50 to 100% sulfide content. So the, the grade profiles along these drill holes is very smooth. Um, so it's not, you cannot use just geology or just, you know, the visual indications to really say what's grade and what's not. So part of that reason, is we, we think this system is a real dynamic magma, you know, um, a magmatic system in its in its metallogenesis. So we, we think that the flow regime through of, of magma through this sill is uh, it has been very dynamic for a long period, and that's left you know a, 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 a sort of a arbitrarily you know high grade zones you know that are either just slightly different ages to one another and and slightly different pulses of uh, of magma flow. So so yeah, we we can't use pure visual techniques to to really de delineate these high grade zones. So we've defaulted basically to a, to a grade cutoff, and in this case, basically we see palladium. We see uniformly high grade, really, we see uniform palladium mineralization throughout the ore body. So wherever there's sulfides, we get palladium metal. So that's really what we've, we've, we've I guess, used the simplification in saying anything above 0.3 grams we consider mineralized, anything above one gram palladium, even though that uh, doesn't take into account the nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum, we've, we've had to use a simplification for the time being just until we get the some, some mineralogy and, and, and enough metallurgical results that we can really, you know, start to move to a palladium equivalent type of calculation. So, so that's where we are for the time being. They, they are quite arbitrary, you know, one gram defined wireframes. And if you change that number, if you use 0.9 or 1.1, I'll just caution the audience that, you know, that the size of the wireframes does change dramatically. So we, we're really at a point, unfortunately, where we need a resource uh, model. We need a, we need some simulation software and some quite high performance, you know, high computational power to be able to really give a, a good indication of what the metal content is in, in this deposit. Just just manual wireframes where we're, we're releasing just to try and aid the, the, you know, people to try and illustrate where these high grade trends are, but they're not, uh, they're not really Definitive, and as I said, they, you know they're oversimplistic because they really ignore the other metals. Right, that was a very good question, and, and thanks for uh, going through that. Um, uh, so, just to uh, reiterate, I think you you mentioned you, that you are sitting on 130 Australian uh, million in cash at present. 
Yes. And, and what is the estimated budget for 2021 approximately? So 2021 calendar year, we don't really, we, we do uh, financial years, June, July. So, you know, we, we um, as an approximation, you know, in, as part of raising that 100 million in, uh, from in institutional investors, we, we outlined about 40 million worth of drilling at Gonville. So, uh, you know, expect to see the majority of that basically, you know, through 2021 that's spent. And then we've got about 20 million for regional work in the state forest. So I guess that's the that's the bulk of the budget coming up, and then obviously about twenty million for other projects as well. So regional beyond Julamar along the West Yulgarn um, province, you know, we've got our you know eight thousand square kilometres here to do a first pass of reconnaissance on, and obviously we've got Victorian exploration to continue as well. So that's sort of roughly the the split there. Um, you know, not all of that is going to be expended in twenty twenty one, but um, we're certainly you know moving ahead rapidly, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we spend. You know, somewhere between thirty and fifty million in uh, in in direct exploration expenditure this year. So you're still very very well funded. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and and sort of I guess we you know we we had a, a huge amount of demand for for um, these placements. We could have accepted more, and we've I guess you know restrained ourselves and just said, well, you know, really we 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 want to keep a lid on dilution just for just until we understand particularly. What uh, what that state forest uh, could hold for us, and uh, just to confirm as well, I think if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned that you've actually completed the uh, 15 million Australian share buyback. So that was not a buyback, an SPP. So what's called a share purchase plan. It's not a not a, a ch not the company purchasing shares, but existing retail holders get, oh. uh, get, get each shareholder gets got the opportunity to basically apply for a parcel of shares. So similar to a rights issue, but a, a little bit more favoured to retail holders. So that um, that was well oversubscribed as well. So we increased that from 10 to 15 million. And, and, and it was about the same price, obviously, same price at the 375. Right. And it's completed. That's right. Yeah, it was completed last week. So those shares were issued. So uh, so basically that that was a straight uh, straight placement at 375 and an SPP to retail holders that at the same price, no, no attaching options or anything like that. No, uh, no uh, North American specials there. Okay, um, maybe um, one one final question. Uh, I think in your your slide on the timeline, you, you were showing that uh, potentially you'll get to, to drill in the the Julemar State Forest around June. Uh, so I'm estimating you you might have results from that in sort of July August. Is that close? Yeah, look, I guess it's a it's a little bit uncertain because really the timeline to get approval here is really out of our hands. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, we're trying to guess, I guess, the, how long the government might take to approve something that really has never been done before. So, um, so it's, it's, you take that as a bit of a guide in terms of timeline, but expect, uh, you know, sort of results, assay results, you know, four to six weeks from, from the time we drill a hole. So, uh, so you know, obviously, if we if we see something visually, I, I guess you know, just given the the nature of the the target there at Hartog, if we see something visually that's that's material enough, I guess we probably you know may even may even release something um, prior to putting out assays. Um, but I guess yeah, you know, the, uh, time will tell. Time will tell. Uh, you know, really what we have there. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's easy for the imagination to go pretty wild. Yeah, it, it sure is. Well, congratulations on the, the results from, I guess, it's yesterday for you and, and overnight for for us. Uh, I, I was very, very imp impressed and pleased with them. And I think we'll uh, we'll wrap up the, the webinar here. So uh, I want to sincerely thank you, Alex, for taking the time to be with us, as well as the audience members for participating in this webinar. And I'll just mention that our, our next web webinar will be with Ken Alaska Uranium on Monday, February 1st at 2 p.m., which will be hosted by David Talbot and will include Peter Dassler, President and CEO, and Corey Bellick, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Ken Alaska. And uh, thanks again and stay safe.